Hi, everyone. I'm Mason Wheeler. I'm the creator of the Pensynchro project. Pensynchro is an ETL framework written in .NET that's used to create high-performance data pipelines. And a couple of years ago, after seeing one too many data engineers complaining online about paying through the nose for data warehousing services, saying things like, oh, we're spending $100,000 a month on Snowflake, I thought to myself, well, I've already got about 20% of a SQL implementation working in the Pansynchro project. How hard could the rest of it be? That was a couple of years ago. Today, the project is almost complete and finally far enough along that I feel comfortable downloading it. So that hard. Data Mountain is a new data warehouse. It's a full SQL implementation written entirely in C-sharp. Here I've got a simple console interface to a local instance. I've loaded it up with ClickHouse's ClickBench dataset, and here's a query from ClickBench that I've got stored here. So I'll put it in here. And that was pretty quick, considering that this is running over 100 million records. Now I've got QuickHouse loaded up also here. Let's see how fast that runs over there. I'm hoping this doesn't embarrass me, because I have not actually done this recently. Point three five seconds. OK. So. I know I said this was going to be faster, and it turns out a little bit slower. That's there are various variation in these things. This is still running very quickly. Um, Quickhouse is, as we see, it's a very fast database. It's written in C plus plus, and I wanted to show that we can achieve similar performance in .NET. Still got a little bit of ways to go. I've been optimizing on this thing right up until about an hour ago. And I think with a few more days, I could get it under this. But let's move on. Thing about databases. They're commonly thought of as being in the realm of system languages. Well, you build them in stuff like C++ or Rust. But we've got some pretty significant cases for dealing with data that .NET is uniquely well suited to. The static compiled database code knows nothing about the structure and the queries that you're using to run it. So you've basically got two ways to deal with it. You can put everything in one unitype box everything up into one value or one type value. And then anytime you need to deal with data, you have to box it into a unitype. You have to unbox it to do any processing on it. This is how Postgres works. And I'm not trying to throw any shade to Postgres. It's a great database. But it's designed for transactional workflows where it's dealing with small amounts of data at a time, so you don't really notice the overhead. The other solution is to statically generate typed or to generate statically typed code for your queries. This requires some sort of JIT. And guess what we've got built right into .NET? We've got with other databases, they've got to build their own compilers. Typically they'll use something like LLVM and build their own systems. Here we've got reflection.emit. We've got Ryujit right out of the box. And then if you want a higher level interface, we've got Roslyn. It's right there on um, it's right there on NuGet for anyone to pull up. The .NET root and type system already has object as a unitype. And the constraint-based generic system lets you insert all sorts of types into existing code and make them work with high performance. 
Anders famously said, a system should use static typing when possible, dynamic typing when needed, and Data Mountain exploits this capability to the fullest, where some days databases will conditionally use JIT compilation when they think it'll be useful. In Data Mountain, the c -sharp compiler is an integral part of the entire process. Like with the with Pansynchro's PanSQL compiled scripts, the query gets translated into C sharp and then compiled. But with Data Mountain, this all happens in process. It adds a certain amount of overhead, but since this isn't designed for a transactional workflow, it's supposed to be a um, it's supposed to be a data warehouse that runs on heavy queries. And so we're assuming that the compilation overhead will be worth it almost all the time. Getting high performance code in .NET is an interesting job. The .NET Core team has done a great job and they continue to do a great job with every release, improving the performance of the JIT and the BCL. If you're attending this conference, you've probably seen Stephen Taub's annual performance increases blog posts. Talks every year about how they've done great work at improving the speed and this project piggybacks on that to a certain extent, but there's only a certain, there's always so far that what's built in can take you. For example, in Data Mountain, we don't use .NET strings. System.string is just too slow to work with. We start off with a custom UTF-8 string library. Well, custom is a UTF-8 string library you can find on GitHub called U8 string and then made a few custom modifications to it to improve performance in ways that U8 doesn't really like because it's designed for general use, but that we can prove are safe, specifically in the context of the database. The nice thing about U8 string is that it's designed internally as basically a slice of a byte buffer. And so you can make other slices of an existing string practically for free. So there's no allocations. There's no GC pressure from that. Likewise, when we originally started out on this project, the SQL parser was written in Angular. Angular is very nice. It's very convenient. It's very slow. Even a simple query would take over a third of a second to parse. So I kept the Antler Lexer because that's simple and pretty fast and rewrote the parser as a simple handwritten recursive descent parser that took down about 95% of the parsing time and about 70% of what remains is overhead from the Antler Lexer. If I really wanted to, I could rewrite rewrite that and squeeze out a bit more performance, but that's getting deep into diminishing returns territory. And we all know that the fastest code, of course, is code that never runs in the first place. Data Mountain uses aggressive filtering techniques to minimize the amount of data it ever has to look at. First, we've got simplification passes in the SQL compiler to turn more complicated expressions into simpler ones. This includes all your basic compiler stuff like constant folding and dead code elimination with a bit of a SQL twist on the latter. If we can prove that a where condition will never run at all, then you can you can eliminate an entire filtering clause. If you can prove that something is false and is chained together by an and subclause with other conditions, then that entire and chain can just be thrown away. Once the query is compiled, you want to run it while changing as little on disk data as possible. Data is stored in a columnar form, which means that instead of writing out all the data as one row at a time, we've got a separate file for each column. Because data warehouses can get very, very large, the tables are, part are partitioned into small chunks. So each of our current databases, has, our current benchmark database has 16 sets of each column file each one containing a piece of the data. This lets the reads be parallelized across CPU cores or even distributed across multiple machines in a compute cluster. And within each file, the data is broken up into pages. 
which are a small set of a few kilobytes of data. Accompanying the database file is a mini index that tells the storage engine the location of each page within that file at the minimum and maximum values of all the data within the pages. This is incredibly helpful at filtering. If you can look at the index and prove that all the values are outside of the range you're looking for, you never have to load the data for that page into memory at all. And if you can prove that all of the values are outside the range, you never have to load the data into memory. Also, you just do a big add range on the list of row indices you're building. We've heard for a long time that getting high performance out of C Sharp requires unsafe code. That's mostly not true anymore with all the work that's gone into performance optimizations and the advent of span over the last few years. The need for unsafe code has diminished quite a bit. But there are still a few points where it's relevant. The one place in the database engine that dabbles in unsafe code is loading data pages into memory. We allocate a big block of native RAM and access it through a read-only span. And this way, all of these byte buffers stay off of the garbage collector's radar. This saves a few precious milliseconds, which can add up if you're reading enough databases or enough data pages. Then filter the columns themselves, filtering on numeric values is done with vector-based operations to run the data the absolute fastest that the CPU can handle. The BCL's vector API ensures that this will run at the maximum possible speed for any given CPU. And it's very, very fast, except for this little block here, where I have to step outside of vector space. Um, I've been been poking Tanner Gooding from the .NET Runtime team for about a year and a half now about a way to make this specific operation faster. And apparently, it's a very, very difficult technical problem. In most CPUs, it's not even possible because they don't have the instruction sense for it. But this is somewhere where I'm watching very closely. And if anything better ever becomes available, I'm going to put it into this code as soon as I can get my hands on the bits. I want to give a big shout out to Tanner and all the members of the runtime team who hang out in the C Sharp Discord channel. They've been a big, big help with all sorts of hairy details over the course of this project. Another thing that's crucial to high performance is locality. If you can run the same code on a bunch of data, on a bunch of data located close together, then you can keep a lot of it in the same CPU cache where everything is blazing fast. Everything that can be done in the columnar realm is done there. And at the core of the data retrieval is a method called filter and project that applies filtering to produce a list of row IDs, then projects those row IDs and a set of column IDs to produce a set of result tuples. Any filtering that can be done inside the columnar realm is pushed down into this method. And then afterwards, anything that requires you to, for example, compare one value, one column with another column, you can't do that in a single column filter. So that happens after the projection. We try and make that happen on as little data as possible. So it's pushed to the end of this pipeline here. Once the data has been retrieved, if you're working with analytics, you usually need to aggregate it. That's what data analytics and data warehousing is all about, is producing aggregate reports of some kind. The original aggregate implementation was copied straight from the PanSQL Framework's PanSQL compiler, which is the script compiler that PanSQL uses to build data pipelines. It has an aggregator object that's basically a wrapper around a dictionary with, um, with the aggregation logic built in. And the problem with that is that if you have more than one ag in the same query, you have a whole bunch of dictionaries doing a whole bunch of lookups over and over on the same data row. 
and the overhead on that, even though dictionary is pretty fast, the overhead on the, that will add up and get heavy quickly. So it's been rewritten, and this is going to be pushed back into the Pansynchro project very soon now. It's been rewritten into a data, a code generation system where the aggregate logic gets created inside of the compilation process. And there's a state variable that contains all of your different eggs for the row all at once. And so if you're computing multiple eggs, then you'd have multiple lines like this. Let's say you've got a min here or a max using a custom hash table to save just a few percentage points of speed over dictionary. And this way, you have your key lookup only once. And then you process whatever the data is, and you're done. Got. This is about the state of the project right now. It runs the entire SQLite um, SQL logic test corpus, which is around 7 million SQL tests. It runs those successfully. It runs several hundred tests taken from the PostgreSQL database um, test corpus. So this is a working system. There are a few things that are still not working, but I expect to have this project up and running very soon now. The last few things to be done, the query overhead or the compilation overhead from Rosalind is enough to be noticeable. The earliest implementation of Data Mountain used direct IL generation with reflection.emit, but that got too complicated too quickly, so I rewrote the code generator to use C Sharp as an intermediate step. Mike Antler, Rosalind is designed for convenience rather than performance. It's fast enough for build servers and IDEs, but it's really not built with high performance computing in mind because that's just not its primary use case. So I'm debating looking at building a direct IL generator again. I'm also looking at building a CUDA generator for truly heavy data loads move everything off of the CPU into the GPU and see how much time that can save. Anyway, that's my presentation. And here's how to find me.